Imagine my emotions when I was planning a wedding with my bride and future beautiful wife, but a couple of months before out that she cheated on me. It's pretty sad, but on the other hand, it's even good because she could have cheated on me already when we were married, but despite this, I still wanted revenge and did it. After delivering an electrifying performance on stage, we basked in the afterglow of what felt like the pinnacle of our lives, a whirlwind of exhilaration and joy. We cheered, embraced, and celebrated like giddy teenagers, intoxicated by the energy of the moment. As the crew from Ravaged Crew began to set up for their performance, we, Starhawk, the opening act for the night in Lansing, M.I., reveled in the success of proving ourselves worthy of the prestigious title of the top local band. Each stop on their tour showcased a different local band, and we rose to the occasion magnificently. Our performance was nothing short of phenomenal. We ignited the crowd, demolished expectations, and exited the stage to thunderous applause. The euphoria was palpable. Off stage, amidst the escalating excitement, I realized with a pang of concern that my fiancée, Catherine, was conspicuously absent. A glance exchanged with our manager, Steve, conveyed a sense of foreboding that weighed heavily on my chest, akin to a heavyweight boxer's blows. Catherine eventually arrived, appearing a bit cautious, I noticed, a few minutes after we began packing our equipment. Her makeup appeared flawless, as if freshly applied, but her hair seemed slightly disheveled, a rarity in Catherine's world. I sensed she was in a hurry to join our gathering. Flushed and breathing heavily, she leaned in for a brief kiss on the lips. I caught a whiff of forbidden plants, aftershave, and cheating coming from her before she quickly pulled away. She didn't mention our successful performance, likely because she hadn't witnessed it, I concluded swiftly. We packed up our equipment and waited backstage, quietly listening to Ravaged Crew perform. I had to admit, they were an incredible band, and I hoped that one day we could reach their level of success and earn as much money as they did. I noticed their drummer, Bobby Lee, glancing over at Catherine several times, even giving her a wink once or twice. When he caught me observing him, he smirked arrogantly, not bothering to conceal it. I suppose when you're Bobby Lee, you believe you can get away with anything. At this stage in their career, Ravaged Crew was on the brink of becoming legendary. Bobby Lee himself was already a legend known not only for his drumming skills, but also for his reputation as a ladies' man with a well-endowed physique. It was widely known that Bobby Lee had been intimate with several A-list actresses and could effortlessly charm women with a snap of his fingers. I couldn't help but wonder if he even needed to snap his fingers to win over Catherine. I approached Steve slowly. He paid no attention to me for about half a minute, gazing straight ahead, before finally acknowledging me. She left the tour bus just after your performance, he murmured to me. Bobby Lee came out a few minutes earlier, all dressed up for the show. That goofy grin plastered on his face. She probably had to tidy up a bit. Damn. I know, not very eloquent, but it was all I could muster at the moment. Our crew departed shortly before intermission and ended up at our usual spot for celebrating. The State Street Bar and Grill. The crowd was thin since many of the regulars were at the concert. We were greeted like returning champions as we entered. It seemed like everyone in the bar knew someone who had attended the concert, and those who were there were busy texting and snapping photos from our performance. Despite the turmoil inside me, I tried to maintain a calm exterior, as I needed time to strategize my next move. I didn't have to avoid Catherine because apparently, she was feeling guilty enough to keep her distance, trying not to make it too obvious. I found a secluded corner at the distant end of the bar, enjoying a sip of Angel Envy Rye. It's pricey stuff, but after a successful performance on stage tonight, the smooth amber liquid felt worth every penny. As I glanced up at the large clock on the wall, I pondered how quickly things had unraveled. In less than three hours, we had finished our sound check with plenty of time to spare before our set. When Vince Knoll, the bass player for Crew, invited the band, along with our partners, onto their tour bus for a pre-show gathering of tequila. I was aware that the crew members were interested in our female companions. Who wouldn't be? They were all stunning. Take my wife, Catherine, for example. She's a 505. Grecian beauty with long, dark brown hair, olive skin. Tonight, 
she had dressed to impress in a snug cornflower blue dress that hit mid-thigh paired with matching heels. The members of our group got off the tour bus ten minutes before the start of our performance. Our companions stayed at the invitation of the guys from the film crew. Jay, our lead guitarist, and I felt awkward about it, but all four of our women reassured us, saying that everything would be fine and they would stay for a while. Are you guys sure? Jay asked. All four of them nodded in agreement. We went to get ready. Damn it, I muttered as I left the bar, got into the car, and headed home, without his bride. It was only five minutes after returning home before our home phone rang. Guess who? Hi, baby, where did you go? I turned around and you were gone, Catherine said. And are you surprised? I retorted. You slept with Bobby Lee tonight. You're in the past. I slammed the phone down on the hook. That should have been a hint. She rushed through the door 30 minutes later, her makeup smudged from tears. We need to talk, baby, she cried, tears streaming down her face. Can you fix this, Catherine? Can you? I shouted at her. She collapsed onto the sofa, burying her face in her hands. He's Bobby Lee, baby. He's a legend, she pleaded. And why should that matter to me? I retorted. He's Bobby Lee, the Bobby Lee, she insisted, expecting me to be proud to share her with him. I couldn't refuse him. Of course not, I replied, dripping with sarcasm. He's been with actresses and supermodels. And that's supposed to justify you cheating on me with him? I interrupted. She looked puzzled until she realized what I said. Anger flashed across her face. Former? Fiancé? Get real, Simon, she exclaimed. Everything's arranged and paid for. We're getting married three months from tomorrow. We're going to be married three months from tomorrow, babe. I'm not marrying Bobby Lee's latest conquest, I stated. My father will be furious, she warned. We have 500 guests coming to the wedding. My parents have invested a fortune in this. Did I mention that Catherine is the daughter of Cameron and Twyla Jefferson from the esteemed Boston Jefferson family, one of the most affluent and influential families in the city? I can't believe I overlooked that detail, as her parents make sure to remind me of it nearly every other day. Despite knowing them for about 18 months, it feels like they've emphasized their wealth and social status in Boston society at least three dozen times. I wasn't exactly their top choice for a son-in-law. While my day job as a chemical engineer at a small firm in Lansing paid a six-figure salary, and my burgeoning music career was bringing in decent money with potential for more, I knew I'd never measure up to the esteemed Jeffersons of Boston. At best, I was tolerated. But perhaps that's how it should be. After all, the most famous figure from Punxsutawney, PA, is a groundhog. My own family, consisting of six members, barely has a combined net worth worth mentioning. We've been in the United States for four generations, having immigrated over in steerage from somewhere in Central Europe. The Jeffersons, on the other hand, trace their lineage back to the early days of America, having accumulated their wealth through traditional means like banking, commerce, and cozying up to English nobility, right up until just before the Revolution. Catherine and I crossed paths during our junior year at Michigan State. She was majoring in public relations. Our first encounter was at a 50s-themed party where she arrived with a date who fancied himself as Elvis Presley, albeit quite uptight. Things took a sour turn when he, perhaps fueled by too much alcohol, bumped into me, causing me to spill my beer. He tried to start a fight, but I quickly stopped it, leaving him unconscious on the floor. Catherine chose to leave the party with me that night. After three months of dating, we became intimate and committed to each other. I proposed to her on our one-year anniversary. Our journey together hasn't always been smooth sailing. Catherine, aware of her beauty and coming from a privileged background, sometimes carries an air of entitlement. This has caused friction between her and some of my less refined friends. She fails to understand why I maintain those friendships, if I truly love her. In response, I challenge her by asking why she never goes by nicknames like Kathy, Cat, or Kate. That's not who I am, she always asserts. Exactly, is my simple retort. I came back to reality when I heard Catherine's desperate plea. Please, Simon, I love you. Only you. We can fix everything. Do you love me? Really? I objected. 
How could you hurt me so much if you love me? It wasn't about love, Cy. It was just an opportunity with Bobby Lee. And try his 12-inch instrument, I spat out. I understand, Catherine, although I don't. She blushed deeply, apparently wanted to answer something, but could not utter a word. Tears were streaming down her face. It was too cold, Catherine. I'm... I'm sorry, Cy. Truth. It was a mistake. Can't we forget one mistake? I put my head in my hands, feeling a sudden headache from exertion. It broke all the agreements, baby. And we're not even married yet. I'm not going to spend my whole life wondering if my wife sleeps with every famous guy she meets. And by the way, you really need to take a shower. I hardly slept on the couch that night. I knew that my decision was the right one. What happened tore me apart, but I still loved that stupid woman. By the time Catherine finally emerged from the bedroom, I was halfway through my fifth cup of coffee. It was evident she had a restless night, looking utterly exhausted. I couldn't help but speculate on what troubled her more, my breaking off the engagement or having to confront her parents. After pouring herself a cup of coffee, she settled on the opposite end of the sofa. Can we discuss this further? She asked softly. I'm not sure there's much left to discuss, I replied evenly. It took all my willpower not to react violently to her presence. I'm sorry, Sai, truly sorry, for both betraying you and causing you pain. I was thoughtless and foolish. It was a terrible mistake. My self-control crumbled. A terrible mistake? I exploded. No, this was a colossal mistake. Apologizing, shedding a few tears, and showing remorse won't suffice. Anyway, if we're done here, your parents are expecting your call. Oh, God, you've already talked to them? She choked out. I felt they deserved to know the truth, and I didn't trust you to do it. It was devastating for them to learn that their flawless daughter was involved with a notorious rock star. Your mother seemed mortified, perhaps contemplating how she'd explain it to her friends over tea. And your father? I thought he might have a heart attack. No father would want to hear that about his daughter. Her tears escalated into full-blown sobs and wails. Oh no, oh no, oh no, I can't believe you betrayed me like that, she cried out. You really thought I'd take the blame for your actions just because you wanted to indulge in Bobby Lee's offer. Be realistic, especially when your father is calculating every penny he spent on this wedding. At least he had the courtesy to apologize to me for your mistake, as he called it. Right before he made it clear he never wants to see me again, and if he does, he might have one of his security guys break my leg. Luckily, I'm not the guilty one here. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm heading to Boomer's place to chat with the guys about our upcoming gigs, and maybe someone will know a place I can stay for a while. Two weeks later, I found a new place to live, and Catherine was out of my life. It hurt, but I was young and knew I'd recover eventually even though the bandmates teased me for the next year by hiding rulers in my car and gear. That's just how they show affection. The end, well, almost. As I returned to my apartment after a five-mile run one Saturday morning, roughly eight weeks following my split with Catherine, the phone began to ring. It persisted for at least six rings before I finally picked up, greeted by a surprise. Hello, I gasped, still catching my breath from the jog. Sigh. Is that you? You sound like you're on the verge of a heart attack or something, Catherine replied. Consciously slowing my breathing, I realized my ex fiance was on the other end of the line. We hadn't spoken since I moved out following our broken engagement due to her infidelity. I wasn't thrilled to hear her voice. What does she want now? echoed in my mind. I just finished my Saturday morning run, I retorted. What do you want? Silence met my abrupt response. I knew my hostile ants were likely caught her off guard. Um, see, I'm sorry to disturb you, but I need to tell you that I'm pregnant. This time the silence on the phone line belonged to me. I stared at the receiver, almost expecting to discern the words traveling through the line. My mouth was probably agape and I'm uncertain how my legs managed to support me. Why are you calling me, Catherine? We're no longer together, I replied flatly, failing to grasp the gravity of the situation. Um, this didn't happen suddenly, Simon. I'm about two months pregnant. 
My doctor confirmed it yesterday, validating what the home test indicated, Catherine disclosed. I must admit, I was momentarily stunned. From the moment she mentioned pregnant, my entire existence seemed devoid of coherence. With a lengthy, coiling phone cord in hand, I stumbled towards my modest kitchenette and collapsed onto one of the stools. I'm determined to keep this baby, she declared. My parents and I expect you to fulfill your responsibilities to our child. Regardless of your parents' opinion of me, I will certainly fulfill my duties as a parent, I replied, before a realization struck me. But you're assuming it's my child. I have doubts about that, Catherine. If I remember correctly, and I do, two months ago, you were involved with Bobby Lee, and I happened to know you weren't using contraception that night. I checked your nightstand drawer when I got home that night, out of anger and curiosity. But we also had intimate moments several nights before that, and I wasn't using contraception then either, she retorted. Maybe, maybe not, I replied. An amniocentesis could provide clarity in a couple of months. Medical professionals still have concerns about the safety of those tests, she stated. Well, then I suppose we'll have to wait until the baby is born for confirmation, I said. Until then? Listen, Sai, we could reconcile, and I'll spend the rest of our lives making it up to you. I'm sorry, Sai. I love you. You didn't demonstrate that love when it mattered, by being more careful, I countered. I think there was a possibility that Catherine and I could be intimate without using a diaphragm, and the baby could be mine. I didn't think it was likely, but I was prepared to take responsibility if it turned out to be true. However, I wasn't willing to raise another man's child, especially one fathered by Bobby Lee. A week later, I received an unexpected phone call. Very unexpected, in fact. Cameron Jefferson asked to meet me at his office. Well, who am I kidding? He demanded that I meet him at his office after work the next day. I wasn't thrilled about being summoned like that. But more than anything, I was curious. Of course, the thought did cross my mind that he might be setting me up for trouble. When Cameron's security personnel escorted me into his office, I felt cautious. I was directed to a seat opposite Cameron who sat behind his expansive desk. In front of him stood a glass of what appeared to be some high-quality liquor in an exquisite leaded crystal glass. That's Pappy Van Winkle, 23-year-old bourbon, my boy. The epitome of sipping whiskey. You'll never taste anything smoother in your life, in my rather immodest opinion, Cameron remarked. It's my way of introducing you to one of life's finer pleasures, which could be yours. Once our business negotiation concludes, as Cameron detailed it, his love for his only daughter led him to offer me a comfortable job with a million-dollar salary and abundant benefits, including a mansion near Boston, so his daughter and her husband could raise his grandchild. Essentially, he wanted to keep secret the fact that his daughter had become pregnant by Bobby Lee. Despite my insignificance, he preferred that I publicly acknowledge paternity of his grandchild, before the truth emerged about his daughter's liaison with the legendary rocker and notorious bad boy, Bobby Lee. I listened attentively to Cam Jefferson's words, translating them as he spoke. To my deep embarrassment, I actually entertained his proposition. After all, I'm only human. Who wouldn't be tempted by the prospect of becoming an instant millionaire? Plus, I'd get to keep my wife. Hold on. What? Why on earth would I even consider that? Sure, she was attractive, but I could find other attractive women, ones who wouldn't betray me ones who weren't already carrying Bobby Lee's child. Admittedly, I might not come across other women with the pedigree of being Jefferson's from Boston, but at least I could look at myself in the mirror without feeling ashamed. I politely declined Cam Jefferson's offer. He acknowledged my decision, mentioning that not many people in their twenties would refuse the amount of money he was offering. Two months later, Come Jefferson's behavior was far from friendly when he bent over the trunk of the car was forcibly pushed into. I should have dealt with you right here, you little troublemaker. You just couldn't help but embarrass us, couldn't you? Even if I hadn't been disoriented by the punches, handcuffed and shoved into the trunk of a car, I would have had no idea what he meant. I replied with the only coherent thought that came to my mind. Hmm? 
This caused a few more light punches to from one of Cam's guards. My left eye was rapidly closing and I was having difficulty breathing. Cam erupted in fury, shouting and striking me with a rolled up newspaper as though I were a disobedient puppy, albeit with a level of force that could incapacitate even the most resilient canine. After the assault, he unfurled the paper to reveal the front page, the notorious National Enquirer, featuring a damning photo of Catherine, unmistakably pregnant, alongside a headline speculating about her relationship with Bobby Lee and the possibility of her bearing his child. I had nothing to do with this, I protested through bloodied lips. I swear, why on earth would I willingly expose myself as a cuckold to the world? I have a good income and I aspire to find a partner who isn't promiscuous. His blows ceased, though I braced myself for more. Several tense moments passed before I dared to open my eyes, finding Cam pacing behind the vehicle. Damn, that actually makes sense, he conceded at last. It's probably one of those other guys in the band, or maybe one of their significant others. I'll look into it. You guys take him to the nearest hospital and make sure to send me the bill. One of the thugs yanked me out of the trunk and forcibly placed me in the rear seat of the car. I left a trail of blood on the leather upholstery as they drove me to the hospital and left me there without a word of apology. And, just to address any speculation, no, I didn't attempt to have Cam arrested. As if that would have been feasible in Boston. Moreover, Cam had bigger problems to worry about than the threat of arrest for assault. The media had a field day for six months at Catherine's expense, treating her as if she were a wannabe Kim Kardashian. I can only imagine the toll it took on her mother, Twyla, who prided herself on being a Bostonian Jefferson through and through. I'm certain she made Cam's life miserable during those six months. He truly deserved it. Catherine returned to Boston shortly after the scandal broke. She married and divorced three times and had four children with four different men, one of whom turned out to be Bobby Lee. It's been a while since I left Catherine, and I haven't been seeing anyone regularly. Then, one Friday night before our concert, one of the guys from the band opened People magazine to a photo of Bobby Lee and his latest fascination with my gear. The joke was tired, but guys have their ways. We milk a joke dry before letting it go. Haha, ha, guys, real knee slapper. I'm laughing so hard I might burst a gut. I quipped as I reached for the magazine, intending to toss it aside. But as I glanced at the photos in the story, something caught my eye. Not that I cared much about Bobby Lee's romantic escapades, but it was the third photo that grabbed my attention. Bobby Lee, the family man, posing with his girlfriend and his mother. A stunning woman, to say the least. Bobby Lee's mom was a knockout in her fifties with long blonde hair, piercing blue eyes, and a figure that would make women half her age envious. Damn. Even the guy's mom is hot, I muttered to myself. I slipped the magazine into my bag, sporting a grin reminiscent of the Grinch's after raiding Whoville of its toys. Over the next month, I delved into some research on Bobby Lee, or rather his family, who, as it turned out, resided in Columbus, O.H., Laura Nostrand, also known as Moms Lee, had divorced Carl Nostrand, or Pops Lee, years ago. Their marriage of two decades ended due to Carl's attempts to emulate his son's promiscuous lifestyle. A glance at Laura's photos revealed a woman aware of her enduring attractiveness at 52. Her attire boasted shorter hemlines than the typical soccer moms, accentuating her ample cleavage without reservation. The more I scrutinized those images, the more I reluctantly acknowledged my own attraction, until a realization struck me like a sudden blow. Both my bandmates and colleagues expressed regret at my transfer to the Columbus, oh, office. I feigned sadness, too, but truthfully, I was rather pleased. With the promotion came a substantial raise. Plus, two months later, I had a date lined up with none other than Laura Nostrand. Encountering Laura seemed like pure chance. She and her friend Sue Jacoby were out for drinks at a local hotspot where Laura was a familiar face as the mother of Bobby Lee. I had anticipated her appearance based on my research, and when they arrived around 8 o'clock I promptly sent drinks to their table. They acknowledged me with a nod, but I remained at the bar until Laura approached me. 
You're either the most audacious guy around or your eyesight might need some adjustment, she remarked in a voice oozing with allure. We're both old enough to be your mothers. Yeah. But if my mom ever resembled you too, I'd be in big trouble, I replied as sincerely as possible. Oh, please, she chuckled. You're the most audacious guy ever. I spent the remainder of the evening in the company of the two women, thoroughly enjoying myself. It seemed evident that they were also having a good time. Before parting ways, I exchanged numbers with Laura and received assurance that they would join me again at the restaurant the following Friday night. On the subsequent Friday, I was quite certain that Laura had dressed with me in mind. Her black dress, cat to mid-thigh, draped elegantly over her his. She wore a black lace bra, which, much to everyone's notice, was prominently displayed throughout the evening. Sue's attire was more understated, perhaps intentionally so, as she played the role of a supportive friend, or wing woman, staying somewhat in the background. Laura appeared less concerned about our age disparity and became increasingly affectionate, frequently touching my arms and shoulders. While we touched on personal topics, neither she nor Sue mentioned her well-known son. I too refrained from broaching the subject, though I harbored a hidden agenda. As the clock neared midnight and they bid farewell, Sue gave me a warm hug, while Laura bestowed upon me an even more intimate embrace and a gentle kiss on the lips. Hmm. I phoned Laura to arrange a date for the following week and she agreed after a brief pause. Are you certain, Cheeky? What would your mother think if she knew you were taking out someone her age? Laura inquired. She'd probably advise me to be courteous and hold doors for you, just as she would if you were 18 or 35 or... Likely the same age as her, Laura chuckled. You can guess, but I'm not revealing my age or my weight. Didn't your mom teach you that there are certain things you shouldn't ask a woman? Bra size, I replied. Age, weight and bra size. But if you prefer not to wear it, then I don't need to worry about it. At my age, which I still do not disclose, I do not find it attractive to walk without it. Girls are not as perky as they were at my age, she said. I think you underestimate yourself. A little strictness will not hurt the appearance. Most guys will appreciate the look without it. Try it and tell me by the end of the evening that I'm wrong. Cheeky and persistent. I suppose this is what I get for spending time with a young man, she concluded. She looked amazing when she met me at the door the following Friday. She was wearing an emerald green dress that accentuated every curve. Hey, she said, my eyes are here, young man. Yes, but something else caught my attention. Right here, I replied, grinning. Just tell me I don't look good. It's ridiculous, she said in a hoarse voice. You look absolutely amazing. Irresistible, I whispered. I tried my best to impress Laura, starting with dinner at Pasqualone's, the best Italian restaurant in Ohio. Then we went to Swing Columbus, a lively jazz and blues club with a dance floor. I may not be the best dancer, but I can keep up, and I knew that most women like to dance. She seemed to be having a great time. I also found that she appreciates good spirits. Savoring the 18-year-old Glen Morangi single malt, as it should be pure and delicious. We conversed throughout the evening, yet the topic of her famous son never arose. I also refrained from mentioning my profession as a musician. It might have been the most enjoyable date I've ever had. As the evening concluded, I received a gentle kiss on the lips and plans for another date the following Saturday. Our subsequent date extended into Sunday afternoon. While we initially planned for dinner and dancing, she suggested we return to her place for drinks and dessert instead. I openly admired her figure and didn't feel the need to conceal my gaze. She coyly smiled each time she caught me staring, which happened frequently. You're quite the confidence booster for an older woman, did you know that? She remarked at one point during the evening. Just doing my part, I responded. We shared approximately half a bottle of Glen Fittich 18-year-old single malt whiskey complimented by her homemade New York-style cheesecake. To my surprise, she also had a talent for baking. During our conversation, she casually mentioned that her son was Bobby Lee, the renowned drummer of Ravaged Crew. I feigned astonishment, having previously mentioned my own involvement in music as a part-time musician. However, she soon revealed the truth about her son. 
I confessed that we had crossed paths briefly years ago when I resided in Michigan. I expressed my admiration for Ravaged Crew, which was genuine until an undisclosed incident involving my fiancé. We ended up in her bed. At first she was a little shy about her body, given her advanced age, but she quickly overcame this as soon as she saw that I found her body attractive. We had a great night. I awoke in the embrace of an extraordinary woman, a goddess in her own right. We began to fill our leisure time predominantly in each other's company. I sensed her attraction towards me mirrored my own feelings for her. This was certainly not part of our initial intentions. I must confess, my initial motive for pursuing Bobby Lee's mother was rooted in vengeance. But what transpired with Laura went far beyond revenge. She captured my heart. Initially, I contemplated keeping silent about our relationship, fearing potential repercussions if she ever crossed paths with my parents. But I realized the necessity of honesty if this relationship was to progress. Admitting the truth wouldn't be simple. It took me three weeks to muster the courage to broach the subject. When I finally did, we were both unclothed, having just shared an intimate moment. It felt like the opportune moment to speak my truth. We lay in bed facing each other, both breathing heavily. Laura gave me a weak smile. I could tell she had given me everything, as usual. I... I need to tell you something, Laura. I began stumbling over my words. And I don't want you to say anything until I'm completely finished. Can you do that? She looked at me intently and nervously. She nodded and I flinched. I told her the whole story about her son and my ex-fiancé. Then I told her about my plan for revenge, and her eyes widened and filled with tears. You jerk, she began, but I put a finger to her lips, silencing her. I never planned on falling in love with you, Laura. You've ruined everything because of me, I said. Tears she had been holding back flowed from her eyes. Do you love me? She squeaked. It was my turn to nod. So let me get this straight. My new grandson, whom I haven't even met yet, is the son of my son and your ex-fiancé. Are you certain? Pretty wild, I replied. Her expression darkened with sorrow. I'm sorry, Simon, she said. He picked up this behavior from his absentee father, who believed in spreading himself thin with every woman. I tried to instill better values in my son. She winced and looked down, then brightened as she met my gaze. Can we take a step back? She asked. What's on your mind? I inquired. I shrugged. You said you love me. Was that true? She questioned. That's what I said, I murmured. She climbed onto me, and we revisited our evening together. We exchanged a few more kisses before retiring for the night. I awoke to find her emerald eyes fixed on me. She greeted me with a bright smile. Assuming I reciprocate your love, of course, she remarked. I returned her smile. So, what's our next step? She inquired. This is uncharted territory. I'm old enough to be your mother. Isn't that a bit strange? The thought hadn't crossed my mind. I realized my mom would probably be shocked to hear about the age gap with my girlfriend. Well, I guess kids are off the table, I quipped. She shot me a serious look. I'm not ready to be a grandmother, she stated firmly. Fair point, I replied, but I do think you should be my wife. Her gaze softened. She locked eyes with me, blinked twice, then burst into tears. I did the only thing I could think of. I wrapped my arms around her and held her close. We stayed like that for several minutes. I do love you, darling, but marriage isn't in the cards for us, she stated seriously. Why's that? I'm into classic rock, I quipped back. But she returned with a stern gaze. The age gap doesn't faze me, Lore. Sure, you might be as old as my mom, but you're nothing like her. You dress differently, act differently, and honestly, you look younger than her, I reassured. So your mom dresses more modestly? Would you like me to dress like that? She retorted. She's my mom, Lore. You're my girlfriend. And you're attractive, I began. You're kind, Sai, but you're quite the flirt. Let's be real here. In ten years, I'll be sixty-two and not exactly a heartthrob, while you'll be thirty-nine. 
Will you still want to be seen with an older woman? She questioned. Who says you won't still be attractive, and aging is a choice, Lore? But seriously, I've pondered this. I'd be utterly miserable without you, and I bet you'd feel the same. I affirmed. Yeah, but that doesn't necessitate marriage, Sai. We can cohabit. It's the norm these days, she suggested. Now it was my turn to give her a firm look. That's not how I see it, Lore. I want you as my wife, my partner for life, my everything. She stared at me in disbelief, shaking her head. I nodded mine. Tears welled up in her eyes once more. Are you sure this isn't some twisted form of revenge, Sai? My mother had reservations about my desire to marry a woman who was her age but appeared and behaved a decade younger. Keep your compassure, Daniel. Remember, she's engaged to your son. Mom scolded Dad. Dad blushed deeply. I'm not as bad as the guy who stole C's first fiancé, he quickly retracted. Laura was taken aback. She blushed and stumbled through her own apology for her son. Damn. I didn't plan on explaining all of that, I muttered. We had a small wedding with only a handful of friends and family. Yes, she invited her famous son who attended the wedding. When Laura introduced us, I could sense he didn't remember me at all. I chose not to mention anything because I had moved past seeking revenge, but Laura couldn't resist bringing it up. You and Bobby have at least two things in common, she remarked, catching his eye. You're both musicians, and you both had relations with the same woman, though Simon had the foresight not to get her pregnant. Bobby appeared bewildered, perhaps due to his rare state of sobriety. That son of yours with that wealthy Boston girl Catherine Jefferson? She was Simon's fiancée when you got her pregnant, back when his band was opening for yours in Lansing, am I? You're just like your foolish father, Bobby. I expected better from you. Costs me a couple million dollars in child support every year, and her parents are loaded anyway. They're a bunch of jerks, Bobby remarked. Absolutely, I concurred. And truth be told, I owe you some gratitude. I narrowly avoided becoming part of that family through marriage. From his vantage point on the beach, Simon gazed out at the waves crashing onto the shores of the big island of Hawaii, where his wife, Laura, was cautiously waiting. A bright smile adorned his face as he reciprocated her wave. Despite being 72, Laura may not have been as youthful as before, but Simon still considered her a stunning woman in her one-piece swimsuit. This two-week getaway marked the celebration of their 20th anniversary. Simon chuckled inwardly, reflecting on how what initially began as a scheme to seek revenge on Bobby Lee had transformed into the ultimate form of vengeance, a life rich with experiences shared with his true soulmate. That's the end of the story. Write your opinion in the comments about this story. It will be interesting for us to read it. Also, do not forget to like and subscribe to our channel so as not to miss new, equally interesting and exciting stories. Good luck!